All right, good morning, everybody. And I'm sorry for the people over here. Hello, I'm, I'm short, you can't see me. <laughs> um, I'm Heather Brushwine, and this is Robin Everhart. We're the co-chairs of this session, which is modulators and mental health. And I know that this is something that we've all been extremely interested in, particularly since um, Trikafta and the effects of it and what have we learned and what can we do about it. So we are really happy to see all of you here today and to get to talk about this. Um, I'm a psychologist at the University of Virginia, and I don't have any disclosures as a moderator, and then um, I put Robbins in too. <laughs> and um, so these are the speakers that we are going to have today and their titles, and we're really excited to have a, a range of topics for you, and particularly excited that we have um, two of our colleagues from European centers who were willing to travel a very long ways to participate with us. We're very excited to have um, a lot of different perspectives here. And so we are going to hold questions for the end. So if you have questions, you can submit them on the app. If you haven't used the app yet for questions, you just go to our session. There's a little Q&A icon at the bottom. You tap on it and you can type in. So if you have any questions, you can put them through there or when everyone's finished, we have these mics as well and we have hopefully allotted for a lot of time for discussion. All right, so first up we have um, Robin is our first speaker. And she is a pediatric psychologist and associate professor in the Department of Psychology at Virginia Commonwealth University. And she works in the outpatient CF clinic at the Children's Hospital of Richmond at VCU. Let me just make sure I know how to advance this for oh, beautiful. Well, good morning, everyone. It's really nice to be here uh, and to be co-moderating this uh, workshop um, with Heather. So the title of my talk is Death Doesn't Feel So Immediate, Changes and Experiences of Health Before and After ETI. And I just want to take a minute um, and recognize my co-authors, so Emma McWilliams and Kristen Reichert, um, as well as the STRC Quest study team. Um, so the study I'm presenting today is from Quest Data, which was a qualitative study, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that. And I have no relationships to disclose um, other than this study was funded by a foundation grant. Okay, so the ways in which people with CF view and experience their health has likely changed um, in the wake of ETI. And in fact, we know that, and that's part of why we're here today, is to, to learn a little bit more about mental health and modulators. Um, so the majority of people with CF are reporting improvements in quality of life, general well-being, um, but we know that there is a group um, that is experiencing side effects and concerns, um, and we'll hear more about that today as well. So using Quest study data, um, we examined people with CF's experience of health in the era of ETI. Um, so Quest stands for Qualitative Understanding of Experiences with the Simplified Trial. Um, and for those who maybe aren't familiar with the simplified trial, I'll just kind of briefly tell you what it is. It was a randomized controlled trial that evaluated short-term withdrawal of hypertonic saline or Dornase alpha therapy um, among people on ETI. And so simplified participants were invited to participate in the Quest study, so it was sort of a follow-up qualitative study. Um, and what we did is we were really interested in learning about the experiences of people with CF beyond the expected health benefits. So we know there are going to be um, reductions in symptoms for most people. Um, but we were really interested in learning um, what are those benefits beyond what we might expect. All right, so methods. Um, in Quest, we enrolled adults and teens. So teens were 14 to 17 years old, um, and they also had a caregiver as well. And we enrolled um, participants in Quest across 39 simplified sites. Um, participants were asked to per participate in two interviews that were remote, either through Zoom or telephone. Um, the first interview was conducted shortly after they completed Simplify, um, and then about four months after that, they completed their second interview. Um, interviews were recorded, transcribed, and coded for thematic analysis. Um, we had 176 interview transcripts that were analyzed um, by two independent coders, um, and we used codes that were developed inductively by the research team. So this slide shows our characteristics of the sample. Um, so we had 91 participants in Quest. Uh, the mean age was 27.4. 
Um, we had a pretty good split between male and female participants. Um, as one might expect, we had about 92% of the sample was white, non-Hispanic. Um, and our mean BMI was 24.7. And you can see that the mean FEV1 um, percent predicted was 91.8. Caregivers, we had 23 caregivers of 14 to 17 year olds. Um, and you can see we had 13 um, caregivers of girls and 10 caregivers of boys. All right. So of the transcripts analyzed, um, as we would expect, most participants described experiencing clinical health benefits of ETI, including improved lung function, fewer respiratory symptoms. Um, but that was not the only thing that we found. And that's kind of where the qualitative data comes in and the richness of it, um, and being able to explore some of that beyond what one might expect. So we had four main themes that emerged. Um, and I'm just going to kind of describe them briefly for you here. And then I'll read some quotes from participants. And they're really rich and very descriptive. Um, and so I'll do that on the next slides. OK, so our, our first theme that emerged um, was the idea that ETI therapy has had a profound impact on the experience of health, so a night and day difference. So really thinking about what was life like, what was my health like pre-ETI until now, and sort of this 180 night and day difference you know, my life has been completely changed. Oops. Um, the second one is there are underappreciated but important impacts of reduced symptoms. And what I mean by this is underappreciated in terms of how disruptive symptoms have been for people with CF um, and how disruptive they've been in terms of their daily lives, their ability to do things. Um, and so really now, when maybe those symptoms aren't quite as pronounced, we're beginning to see kind of just how impactful those symptoms were. The third one is ETI has reduced the mental burden on people with CF. Um, so really thinking about how much of the space in someone's brain is really taken over by cystic fibrosis and thinking about it and kind of how much that drives their daily life um, in terms of what they're thinking about. So uh, that mental burden has been reduced. And the last one uh, uh, has to do with being able to shift someone's focus to managing overall wellness and other comorbidities. So maybe CF isn't kind of the main um, factor in their health that they're focused on now, and so being able to think about other um, aspects of wellness. OK. So the first one was profound impact of ETI on experience of health. And I'm just going to read these to you because, again, I think they're so rich. Um, so this is from a 26-year-old female. And she said, it is night and day difference. Before I started tri Trikafta, I really went into it thinking, yeah, maybe it'll help me a little bit. I had no idea it would completely change my life. And then from a 29-year-old male, I was kind of on a downward spiral that just couldn't be stopped, really. I was just coughing up a ton of blood. When I started taking tri Trikafta, everything kind of reversed. I haven't coughed up blood since the day I started taking Trikafta. I hardly produce any mucus. So you can really see just this change, um, this 180. All right, so underappreciated but important reductions in symptoms. So from a, um, I like this one, from a 52-year-old male. At work, I was always the guy who coughs a lot. I was always the guy who's always coughing. I was just the coughing guy. And that change mentally, I just felt far less self-conscious. And then from a 29-year-old female. I've been able to gain about 15 pounds since being on Trikafta. And it is crazy to me that I look the way I do and feel as capable as I do. I've done a lot of work physically, as well as mentally, to kind of overcome the story that was reinforced to me as a young person that I was small and unathletic and weak. All right, and then for reduced mental burden of illness for people with CF, um, this is from a 21-year-old male. And I like this one a lot. Um, it's a complete outlook on life shift. You don't feel as if you're waiting for the train to fall off the tracks. So again, just thinking about constantly waiting for something to go wrong, waiting for that next hospitalization. Um, so really that mental burden. And then from a 37-year-old male, it's just been such an incredible drug. Yeah, I feel like everything's on the table at this point. It's hard to describe. It really is hard to describe. My mental state two years ago was so different than it is now. And now I'm much more willing to take a risk than I was back then. And then our last theme was future health priorities. Um, and this is from a 45-year-old female. I guess the bar has just unexpectedly raised. I can expect to have a higher bar of health than I did before. So it, is, so it has sort of changed how I think about things like going to the gym. Before, I think the bar was lower for myself. And then the last one is from a 35-year-old female. 
For the first time in my life, I've been able to address diabetes as my main chronic illness and make decisions there that are more in consideration of diabetes than of my CF lung disease. So I've had to completely change my diet so that my blood sugar is happy, which was really a secondary consideration before ETI. So in conclusion, I think those themes and our quotes, and we've got a lot that are really, really fabulous, um, but they really highlight a lot of the transformative positive experiences um, that have reduced daily physical and mental burden for people with CF. Um, but I wanna be really clear that this sample is from our Quest study, and so it may not generalize to other samples. Um, this is a sample from Simplify, and uh, to be eligible for Simplify, um, people needed to be actively taking Trikafta, so that means they were comfortable continuing on it. Um, so we're not necessarily capturing the experiences of those who are not doing well on ETI. Um, so ETI, sort of based on our um, analyses and, and our study, has really changed people with CF's definition of what it means to be healthy um, and thinking about what people can begin to achieve in their lives and even kind of their identity as someone with CF. Um, but if we begin to think about the implications for this work and what does that mean, um, we probably need to reevaluate some of our goals of care and our outcome measures in clinical trials. Um, people with CF may have higher expectations for their health um, and what they can do, and we as care teams probably need to raise those expectations as well. Um, and then if we're thinking about our measures and how we are assessing symptoms, changes in symptoms, quality of life, um, they may also need to be updated and be a little bit more sensitive um, to these changes. And that's it. And I just want to thank all the participants in our study um, who participated in the Quest team, or the Quest study, and also our Quest team. And you can see um, some STRC researchers there, um, principal investigators as well. Um, and this was an STRC study supported by CFF grants. And please, you can also check out these other posters with our Quest data, 482, 503 and then our poster is 489. So thank you. All right. So next we have um, Dr. Kimberly Pasley. Um, she is a psychologist and pediatric mental health coordinator at Nationwide Children's Hospital. There we go. All right. I personally don't have any disclosures. Uh, this a uh, particular research study that I will be talking about today was funded by an intramural funding grant through uh, our local hospital at Nationwide Children's Hospital. All right, so as we all know, treatment burden for patients with CF is quite large, literally. Um, it is well established that the patients definitely have a history of mental health issues, both adults, teens, kids, and then in addition to um, adding on the ETI, we are learning about how this drug is interacting with their mental health. So our question today is, what is the impact of ETI and management of psychiatric symptoms? All right, so digging into the literature, we were trying to find what else do we know and what else can we uh, speak about that someone else who's might have commented on this and this article by Zhang looked at changes in psychiatric medications for this population. Uh, this was an adult population um, and obviously we didn't see a lot of changes in their GAD7 scores on the PHQ9 scores. Um, about 55% were not prescribed psychiatric medications. Um, but the 22% did initiate or change medication during the study time. And those that changed medication endorsed higher symptoms of anxiety and depression. So that was our starting point of what do we know about the population that we are looking at um, through our study. So for our group, we began following the mental health of patients at Nationwide Children's Hospital as soon as they initiated ETI and have been slowly expanding our study population, especially as the FDA has lowered the age limit. 
Um, so this study is part of a longitudinal five-year study. Uh, we have so much data <laughs> and I will be swimming in it for many, many years to come. So for today's purpose, uh, we, especially for this poster, we chose to just pick a little sliver of what was going on. So we were only looking for this, today's purposes, um, on the first 12 months of the patients that were taking ETI. And we're looking at patients who have used psychotropic medication during this time period, regardless of age, and followed them for the first year. So this is the population that we're talking about. So our study population is growing because we have rolling enrollment. So we were roughly 326 patients when I started this poster. Um, we have pretty good division of adult and pediatric patients and gender male and female. Um, unfortunately, we have a pretty homogenous population, not a lot of diversity in Columbus, Ohio. Yes, we have some diversity, but it's Ohio. Um, so we definitely own that one. <laughs> So much of our study was digging into charts. Ooh, very time intensive. So we pulled anyone who had uh, psychiatric diagnoses and we looked at all of these different ones. Uh, we are going to, of course, only focus on anxiety and depression for today's purposes. Um, but I'd also like to note that there's that big column at the end of folks that don't have a diagnosis of psychiatric disorders. Um, they are either doing okay or they're doing okay right now. So, All right, so only 35% of our population were taking psych psychiatric, pop uh, were taking psych psychiatric medications at baseline. Uh, this is not because only 35% of our population needed psychotropic medications. That's just how the world works right now. So similar to other places in the United States, and we'll hear otherwise if there's what the challenges are across the world today, um, Ohio has its share of barriers to mental health care. So as with many places across the U.S., we have a huge mental health stigma, especially in places where there are not a lot of resources. And I remember having a lot of conversations where an individual would look at me and say, my mom's depressed, my dad's depressed, my aunt, my uncle, that's just who we are. We live in trailers, we have trouble keeping food on the table, uh, and that's just the way it is, that learned helplessness. Um, and it's very sad and we're trying to combat that, but sometimes that is the reason why um, they're not getting what they need in terms of their mental health support. Financial and insurance issues. A lot of our patients are on Medicaid. Uh, finding people who take Medicaid is not the easiest thing in the world. Uh, and then for our aging population, they might be on Medicaid or Medicare. Um, as my mental health coordinator, I collaborate with an adult mental health coordinator <laughs> sitting in the back of the room. And um, we, we, we commiserate in how to find counseling, how do we find um, medication management providers who will take our patients. Uh, if we thought Medicaid was hard, try Medicare with this aging population. It's not getting any fun, more fun. Limited access to behavioral health providers. There are certain communities that just don't have the options. Um, so we're struggling with access there. Uh, mental health symptoms interfere with seeking treatment. Uh, I have several young adults that their social anxiety is so high um, that we have to talk through having the phone conversation with calling, call, making the call to set the appointment and get services started. And often I'll have conversations like, can we do it today? Can we can we role play it out today? Can we give you a script? Can I help you? And they're like, no, but I feel so supportive that this is important and I know I need to do it, that I'm going to practice and I'm going to do it next week and you can call me afterwards. And I'm like, great. And I'm going to do it, in, she said, in my room with the door closed and my mom can't hear and I'm just going to do it. And I call in a week and 
I haven't gotten up the guts to do it yet. So, um, and then of course we have our folks with uh, no mental health symptoms that they're reporting. So the there's a few others that have definitely popped up as we have a few that are having trouble with insurance. And this is somewhat of a recent issue as people are losing their coverage. Um, pandemic was sometimes served some of us very well in terms of providing health insurance. And now all of those perks are starting to go away and our patients are definitely noticing and are struggling. We also have very long wait lists and uh, limited room in people's schedules to be able to work them in. Um, the other thing that we also know is um, if someone is in psychiatric crisis, there are not a lot of places that we can send them. Um, for pediatric patients, I can send them to our whole new beautiful behavioral health pavilion. Um, but if they are over 18, I cannot, they will not take patients over 18. So when they are in psychiatric crisis, I don't have a lot of places to send them that will take their insurance and has, have room for them. So who is prescribing the, the medication for our patients that are able to get on medication? Um, we tend to send them a lot back into the community because that's what we can make work. So there's a lot of PCP and uh, pediatricians. Local psychiatrists are not the ones we usually end up finding, but the psychiatric nurse practitioners, we have a higher probability of getting into. Um, as I said before, Nationwide Children's Hospital Behavioral Health will take kids up until 18. So we have this window at 18 where the kids have to change and find new providers. Um, our adult member, adult providers are sometimes willing to help um, uh, get some of our adult patients onto medications. And every once in a while, we are able to get them into Nationwide Children's Hospital and their developmental pediatricians, their pediatricians, psychiatry, but the wait list are really long. All right, so as many people have talked about, there's that great article that Dr. Bathgate um, wrote that highlighted our first line of where we, we want to send them to get started on psychotropic medications. And these are the ones that we really, really hope that they start with because this is what the research has led us to um, lean towards and what we give them a little bit of guidance as they go back to their PCPs or their community providers and say, please try to start with these and make those have those conversations um, with your community providers. So my pharmacist and I work very closely together and she um, had a, a, a request. She said, please tell them about this new one. <laughs> um, this is one of those where the collaboration of what medications and the drug interactions, we work really closely together. And she said, please let them know that this one we're not recommending because it has a cough suppressant ingredient in it. And we know that is not what we're looking for for our CF population. So this was a new, whoops, um, a new piece of information that she's like, just throw it out there. I'll put it on the slide, Emily. <laughs> so what do they look like in a year? What do our patients look like a year after being on Trikafta? So it's really, really nice that the biggest piece of pie, the 39% is the no change in medications, kind of just holding in the stable area. Um, some of them, the 23% reduced either the number of the medications or their, their dosage. So again, not seeing spike in their mental health symptoms. 4%, maybe that's a change of just flipping medications or um, maybe insurance change and they needed to, their insurance made them change to a different medication. So the big ones that we're obviously going to pay attention to is this green 34%. So what is going on with this? Um, this is the one that we're worried about. Has Trichafta caused an increase in mental health, health symptoms that has resulted in their needing more medication? So we don't have enough information and this is obviously as i said this is a five-year study i have lots of patients and i'm going to be digging into this really hard in the future um, but we're not done yet so i'm not done digging <laughs> more to come 
um, we need to know about this 34%. However, for today's presentation, I did my random sorting and I went like this and I said, took the, th the study IDs of the 34% in that green piece of pie and I went like this. And I picked one patient that is in that 34% and said, what happened in this first year? What happened? So the one that I randomly picked was a 17 year old female. So she, this was past the six month mark of being on Trikafta and she showed up in clinic and she was being screened that day and whoo, her PHQ-9 was high. We saw symptoms of appetite changes, sleep changes, mood changes, and I sat down with her and said, Woo, what is going on? And she said, it's not good. My parent is being, it went to jail. My parents are divorcing. There's just fighting between the intergenerations. I'm fighting with my boyfriend. It's just not good and I can't do this. And of course I do my job. I'm the mental health coordinator. So let's see what we can do. She came back and said, I don't really trust mental health. I've had bad experiences. And I said, have you ever met any person ever in your life that has similar to my job that you feel you have a trusting relationship with? And she said, well, there's this person I met one time when I was hospitalized. I'm like, great. What'd she look like? <laughs> Limited choices here. I figured out who it was. We linked her. So she's now in counseling with this person. I got her into psychiatry. We got her on a little Lexapro. Uh, we called her, her mom with her permission and we activated her family supports of she's having a really rough time. We need to keep a careful eye on her, um, letting us know if this gets worse, we need you to look out and do all the safety awareness and supervision as much as you can supervise a 17 year old as you can and, and get everybody on board activating our family supports. So we did. So a couple months later, she came back to clinic and she was using all of these mental health supports. And I said, how's it going? And she said, I know what got me there. And I said, great. What did you figure out? It was the boyfriend. Yep. Breaking up with her boyfriend. That was what had just launched her into that really bad place. Um, 17 years old. So when we look at that 34%, <laughs> there could be a lot going on in our patients' lives and adverse events could be what's going on. And we can't make that assumptions and causation of what's going on during that first year. So this is what, when you look at everyone else that was uh, taking psychotropic medications, what are they on? What are we using? Um, the highlighted ones are the ones that we really hoped that they were using and we're thrilled that they're using. Um, but we also understand that they're on a bunch of ones that make our pharmacists and some of us a little bit nervous because we don't really like those meds in CF. But we're having, the, that's the collaboration of working in a clinic and a multidisciplinary um, collaboration. And we have this conversation of, this is the fourth psychotropic medication that they've, that they've used, or they've tried th these three. I mean, so much polypharmacy to try to find the right answer for their sleep issues, their anxiety issues, their depression issues. So we're on a lot of different meds. And as you can see, sleep is a huge one as well at the bottom. So, so as we know, many patients have the history of anxiety and depression and sleep problems, but aren't necessarily on psychotropic medications for good, for not good. Maybe they don't need it. Great when they don't need it. But for those that have required medication, the largest chunk of them have been pretty consistent in the type of medication they need, the frequency and the dose indicating to me that so far we're staying pretty stable, which is excellent. Um, and those that have met necessitated an increase or in dose or number of medications is about 30%. So most of the patients who made adjustments um, used SSRIs, which we know is the recommend 
recommendations that we send out into the community. Um, and those that use them usually have both diagnoses of anxiety and depression. So this one, of course, going back to Zhang's study, matched that the people that are having the most amount of trouble were the ones who were b balancing both anxiety and depression diagnoses. So there are so much data and we are just at the very tip iceberg of what we're needing to look into these into this data. So we know that there's so many limitations for this particular study. Um, diagnoses were based on self-report for some of our adults, especially for our adults. Um, and our history and use of medication was often pulled out of chart review. Um, often we had to do that reconciliation with all of the uh, pharmacy information that we can. Um, and statistics don't take into account that this is there was a lot of other things going on in the past few years. This is rolling enrollment for our families. So some of them started Trikafta before the explosion of the pandemic and some have started now. Um, so what it was going on in the world is going to be highly variable when they started it and what that one year of first year of um, being on Trikafta, what that one year was is not, you can't assume that it was the first year that it was approved. So that is going to require a lot more digging to, to take that into account. So I have quite a big team in terms of our pulmonary research core um, and our other mental health coordinators and other members of our team that have been so beneficial in doing this research and helping me get ready for today. So that's it. Thank you, Kimberly. And we have a lot of great questions coming in, so just keep sending them in. We're tracking them, and we will get to as many of them as we can. Our next speaker is Lily Kristen, and she is a psychologist and associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at the Medical University of South Carolina. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for having me today. Um, I am going to be talking um, about uh, a use of the CFQR um, in this context of ETI today. Um, I want to just acknowledge I have no disclosures, but I my disclosure is that this is not a project that is mine. It is our quality improvement programs, and I'm honored to be presenting on behalf of our group. I um, will talk a little bit about our program as well that we use. So body image has a lot of definitions out there. I, I really like um, this one which comes from the CFRESH uh, group. They have a lot of great resources too, just a heads up on body image. The subjective picture or mental image of one's own body established by both self observations and by noting the reactions of others. And so body image is really about the personal relationship that we all have with our bodies. Um, we have our mind and spirit, and then we are all walking around in these vehicles, if you will, that are such an important part of, of our daily experience. And we're not only sitting in our perceptions of our body, but also we are social creatures and are constantly picking up on data and information from those around us. And so, you know, each person's body image is unique. It evolves over time and really comes from a whole host of factors that contribute to one person's relationship with their body. Um, I, I loved, I don't know if anyone was in the talk this morning about um, uh, weight and um, the, the kind of discussion around the cultural factors. Um, that is just such an important piece of this discussion. I want to highlight um, body dissatisfaction as well. Um, this is the idea of when we become displeased with our shape and size. It's not about what others are saying necessarily, but it's how we feel. And this self-perception predicts adverse psychological consequences and can impact health behaviors too um, and, and mental health. So these are some things to keep in mind. 
I, I want to make a quick note. I'm going to be using the term BMI throughout this and the standard that has been there um, for many years, but I really, really appreciate it. Um, I think it was Deidre um, Jennings who talked this morning about really acknowledging that BMI is, is truly an inadequate um, construct when we're talking about the health and, and also the weight of people with CF. So I'm going to be using those terms, but um, let's just acknowledge that we need to move past them. I want to share this. This is a diagram from one of our patient handouts. Um, I, I, we use the CF, CFresh resources to kind of come up with this list. And I'm, I'm showing this here because we're, I'm going to be focusing in on um, this very tiny little piece here, this, this one up there, weight gain. Um, in general or after starting modulators, but this really highlights just how diverse body image is in CF. And so truly kind of thinking about when we're measuring this, there are so many more dimensions to this than I'm going to be talking about today. So thinking a little bit about where we are um, in, in this journey um, around discussing weight for adults with CF and people with CF in general, um, throughout the research, there's, you know, there's, we've been documenting weight gain after ETI, body mass index and nutritional intake following ETI modulator therapy, obesity and CF, prevalence trends, et cetera. These are some of the um, article headlines. There are many more than I pulled up here. I just pulled a few. And, you know, throughout all of these, I, I and our group found an absence of body image discussions. And so, you know, body weight and BMI are not body image. They are not equitable. Um, and I, I also just want to acknowledge, though, that the changes in the zeitgeist of where we are with CF, this era, um, there are changes to people with CF's bodies, um, weight gain, which has been different for um, many of them, and it can impact their personal body image. This is one of the diagrams from St. Peter et al. in 2022, just to highlight the, the kind of new aspect of this. So this is the, uh, a little scatterpot showing the proportion of people who are overweight or obese in CF. Um, and you can see the trajectory of especially classified as overweight is increasing. Um, I think the recent statistic I saw was 40.4% in 2021 um, that is the prevalence of overweight and obesity among adults with CF. So to introduce our quality improvement program briefly, um, we participated in the um, RDN lung transplant QI program back in 2019, pre-pandemic, and then forged through during the pandemic. Um, and we, you know, it was a very interesting time to be doing this. We did this, um, um, you know, amazing set of trainings, came up with this wonderful lung transplant referral process um, you know, prior to modulators coming out. And then they, the modulators come out and many fewer of our patients needed to be referred for lung transplant. And we had such a, a good time with this group that we decided to just form our own quality improvement group. And we've been meeting um, bi-monthly ever since. So our team is really cool. Um, our center is, um, we have a pediatric center and adult center, um, and our group um, joins together for our quality improvement discussion. So um, many of us on the team are shared between teams. So I'm both on the peds and adult teams, um, and some are unique to the other teams. So our nurse coordinators and our um, providers. And so we, we get together one or two times a month, and we focus on what is coming up with patients. What do we need to be helping patients with? How can we improve their experiences? And so we broadened our focus to a lot of different areas. Um, we've been talking about transition, um, improving our pro progress there. We've been we've been talking a lot about body image and um, some other kind of procedural things in the clinic. And the body image data that I'll be presenting today was really drawn from all of us hearing concerns about weight gain and, and body dissatisfaction. So patients saying, I don't like how I feel. I'm so happy my lungs are doing great, but my I don't feel comfortable in my body. And so we started, um, you know, this, this, uh, 
screening process really as a way to foster conversations. We were not really intending on the front end and collecting data per se. We collected it, but we really wanted to use screening as a mechanism for formally approaching discussion of body image at least annually. And that's how we introduce it to patients. Um, our center is a little bit uh, unique in that the uh, mental health screening is done by myself, a psychologist standard, and our genetic counselor, not a standard in our CF community, but it's it's been a really wonderful um, uh, partnership. And so she and I are typically the ones who first have this conversation. We introduce it as saying, hey, we're doing this thing now. Um, body image is something we want to pay attention to. We're going to be doing these screening questions, but really what we want to do is foster a conversation with you about this. And so um, we also developed a bunch of resources, um, and we've been doing this since 2022. And I, again, I'm going to be presenting a very tiny piece of that, and our discussions are so much more broad. I feel like that initial diagram is kind of more reflective of the conversations we have with patients, which are about every aspect of their bodies under the sun, um, not just weight. So we, we, as we were trying to think about screening, we wanted it to be short, you know, burden of screening period in clinic is, it's a lot. So we wanted something brief. We went through a lot of uh, searching of the literature to find if there were any good brief measures we liked. We ultimately decided to use the CFQR, um, but we, we noticed that there was, it, despite how amazing it is, the body image scale needs some updating. Um, and so this is what, what I hope to, to kind of start the discussion today is about making sure our patient reported outcomes are are reflecting this new zeitgeist because we 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 used this measure and I'll show you how it how it worked for us um, but we also added a question so one of the um, this 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 measure you know we hear about it so frequently frequently at the conference and it's it's really been such a landmark measure for making sure we're paying attention to not just the medical indices but also patient experiences um, but it doesn't assess concerns about body weight gain so these are the three items um, on the CFQR Y'all are probably very familiar with these. I think I am too thin. I think I look different from others my age. And I feel bad about my physical appearance. Now, again, we could have added many, many, many other potential items. But after you know our discussions with patients, we were specifically interested in providing support about, I think I weigh too much, uh, concerns about weight gain. So we had a few iterations of how to phrase this, got some patient input. Um, our whole team gave some input. And this is the phrasing we decided upon. So we had patients just complete this along with their mental health screening for um, about, about well, we're still ongoing, but starting um, in August, uh, April of 2022. And um, we, you know, the typical scoring, the body image scale is zero to 100, higher scores are higher quality of life. Um, and just to highlight, as we did this, um, again, I, not to diminish the uh, important of, import of screening, but I really kind of say this is literally, we're doing this just to foster this conversation. And so really the richness of these interactions came from having a standard way of introducing this um, to them. And again, I can't emphasize enough how valuable that's been in terms of helping to uh, make sure we're supporting patients. We, Because this has been a group effort, you know, some sometimes it involved discussions with our, you know, encouraging uh, discussions with our, our medical providers. Sometimes it was like, oh, hey, let's get the dietitian to talk with you about X, Y, and Z. Let's have our respiratory therapist talk to you about um, how, how your physical activity is impacting your body image. We all were comfortable with the language. We did this as a team. And so, you know, sometimes after my discussion with a patient, I'd say, oh, like, hey, you know, respiratory therapist, can you go in and talk about X, Y, and Z? Or we'd really, really engage the whole team um, from that. So um, we also gave universal feedback. Um, we have some handouts, we have resources. Um, I'll share some of them at the end. Um, and I'm just going to be showing some descriptive data, very, um, and like literally showing it on really just one item. But um, I think it kind of tells a story that we, um, there's a lot more to um, look at here. Our 127 adults, um, I should note too, um, I, we do, we've done this with all of our patients. So if 12 and up, if they're doing mental health screening, they're doing this. Um, I'm only presenting on the adult data here. But I, I got to say the conversations about body image with our teens has been one of my most... Um, uh, 
it has been the most rewarding um, because really they don't talk about that with anybody else. And they're not talking about with parents or friends. They keep a lot locked up inside. And so I, I encourage folks to especially address that with your teens. Um, our group is um, roughly equitable, um, male, female here that I'll be talking through. We um, do also do not have a terribly diverse um, population in South Carolina um, with just eight of our patients who were non-white. Um, we generally have pretty high um, FAV1, um, com, you know, comparatively, and but we also have a pretty high BMI, uh, you'll note. Um, most of our patients were on modulators, um, and uh, some of them had, for reasons of not tolerating or other reasons, went on, were on other modulators than ETI. So I just want to highlight, um, as from our data, again, with these BMI categories that I just said don't use, but you know, we, do, we, we have to use them in some ways, I, just to give a sense of where our patients fell, 47% um, of our patients fell in this range of experiencing overweight or obesity. And I really want to acknowledge that if patients are having concerns about weighing too much, then this wouldn't be captured by the original CFQR items. Maybe the about dissatisfied about physical appearance, but not that specific concern. So here's our data just descriptively from these response options. Um, I really was so excited to see the kind of area highlighted here um, that many, many of our patients really don't feel like they look different than others their age. They don't feel bad about their physical appearance. Um, I think that that's a really lovely strength. And actually, you know, in discussing with patients, I think that that led to a lot of great discussions about what do you like about your body? How how are you how are you honoring your body daily? Um, and you know, also noting kind of some of the language here. Um, you know, I would talk some about physical appearance, and you know, the difference between that and feeling settled in your body, feeling confident in your body, um, noticing what your body can do. And so, I think there's some also possible um, areas for um, increasing the multidimensionality of these items from that perspective too. Also then draw your attention here. So if we look at patients' perceptions of their body weights, um, it's really interesting, I thought. Um, I think I am too thin. Only four patients said very true to that, only 3% of our, our sample here. Um, Whereas 15% said very true to, I think I weigh too much. Um, it's a pretty big difference. And if we just break that out kind of in terms of who, how the fa folks answered, um, almost twice as many folks answered um, true to, I think I weigh too much than um, I think I'm too thin. So in relation to other variables, again, I don't want to harp on BMI, but um, they, the, this new item was associated with um, increased concern, higher BMI was associated with concern with weighing too much and lower BMIs were associated with being too thin. So kind of um, some, some congruence there. Um, and there were some sex differences just with females having significantly lower scores. So indicating feeling that they weigh too much, somewhat true or very true more frequently than males. Um, significantly so. Now I know this, I, I, in graduate school I was a psychometric nerd. I was joking with Robin before this that I trained with Bryce McLeod and um, I, psychometrics, I just want to make a quick note. I honor them and respect them. Um, we did do a little just fun calculations here of what the CFQR scoring would be um, if we added in our fun item too. Um, so zero to 100 here, higher scores indicating better health related quality of life. Um, the original items, if we scored it as we it, with the you know kind of the standard um, items it was about a 72 so uh, if we added in our items it dropped to 66 um, I just adapted the scoring as um, you would with uh, more items but if you included them all it's about 70 and now this is again a, again we need to there's so much more data that needs to be gathered I like was going back and forth why you should even share this because of the need for more um, analysis but I think it tells a story that you know, what are these numbers? They're, they're just numbers. But from what we hear from patients, these things do really matter. And I think these numbers kind of line up with the patient story and experience. So we love the CFQR. It is a, such an amazing landmark and has really spurred our field towards being really leaders um, 
in, in, in the area of um, patient reported outcomes, but it doesn't capture the contemporary body image concerns. Um, and there are some other areas that I know folks have talked about adjustments in, and I think, you know, this is a, a great time to consider some of that. We, um, in our project here, um, we noticed that there were more folks, and this is really lining up with our discussions, that they felt that they, their, their weights were too high from what they're comfortable with. They were dissatisfied with that. That was a lot more prevalent than those who felt that they were too thin. And again, I really want to highlight in all of this that like a lot of people are actually really satisfied with their weights. I can't tell you how many discussions I had with folks saying like, I'm just so, so happy I don't have to worry about like my low weight. I, I feel like my discussions with the team are so much better because we're not having that same discussion every time and I feel good in my body now. And so that, I don't want to lose sight of that. Um, I, I wanted to note our mean BMI as a center is higher. Um, 25, uh, the mean is in the overweight range. And again, this is a very, uh, there's a lot of limitations here. This is a QI project. Um, and, you know, this is looking at some of our, our real data. So again, I, I want to acknowledge some of those limitations. I love this picture here. Um, it says, I, and as I said to my body softly, I want to be your friend. It took a long breath and replied, I've been waiting my whole life for this. And I feel like that is kind of the journey we see with our patients. Like we, you know, we talk a lot about weight and all of these things and these health indices. And what we really want for our patients at the end of the day is to have this, you know, fierce appreciation for themselves and their strength and what their bodies have been through. That's what I want at least. And so we got to acknowledge weight gain is a concern. Like that's a dissatisfier right now for many patients. And we, you know, talking about it, um, you know, from a perspective of not only what we can do to address the problem, which, you know, I think is a, a growing discussion, you know, in terms of addressing the actual weight, but also addressing the psychological impact of a changing body. You know, I think any of us, I know I had a, I had, I had twins and was pregnant at CF five years ago. So I sure as heck had body image changes when I went through a twin pregnancy. Like I can really empathize with that experience of very quick, well, weight gain and other things. I, it's, it's feels like you're not yourself. And I think that that's the piece that I really want for folks to take home from this. Um, I'm always happy to share what we do. Our body image screening is feasible, valuable. Patients like it. They, I, we love the discussions that come from it. Um, and I want to highlight that, you know, our, our, um, these constructs are so multidimensional. Um, I think uh, patient reported outcomes themselves are you know, really, are really important to kind of update because CF has changed so much since it, um, Alexandra Quitner developed that measure. It's, um, it's been, I mean, in so many ways encouraging, but we have to kind of update our patient report of outcomes as well. I, I, um, I just want to acknowledge again the that great contribution of this measure. It's really kind of a landmark across disease states for um, measuring patient reported outcomes too. There are a lot of resources out there. Um, I'm happy to email any of these things or any of my slides to folks. Um, I just want to highlight especially the CFRESH resources. I love those. Um, and um, some of the uh, patient stories. Um, I'll give a special shout out to that first one there. She's um, one near and dear to our center. Um, and, you know, these brave folks who have come forward and shared their experiences with body image. Um, I just love, love, love those on CFF. Um, and so I want to end with actually one of the patient stories here, um, how CFTR modulators changed my reality. This is actually pre-ETI. Um, Tizacaftor and Ivacaftor hasn't made a big impact on my lung function, but I'm noticing that I gain weight a lot more easily than I used to. For someone who's struggled their entire life to gain weight and keep it on, this is a pretty dramatic shift in my body and in my understanding of what it means to take care of it. At the same time, I've had a dawning realization that the body I'm seeing in the mirror is not the one I'm used to seeing. To be honest, I get nervous now when I post pictures of myself on social media because I know that they don't match as closely with what the outside world, and especially the internet, tells women is beautiful. And I just thought that narrative from Elaine was such a great way to capture this um, experience. So. Thank you so much. I'm happy to answer questions at the end. And I want to give a big shout out to my quality improvement team for helping with this whole project. All right. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Dr. Simon Graber. 
um, and he is a pediatrician and clinician scientist working uh, in Berlin, Germany. Find your slide. Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction and thank you very much for the invitation to come to, to, come to this great conference. And I'm happy um, to present our work on the effects of um, ETI on mental health in patients with CF. So um, these are my potential conflict of interest, but the study was not sponsored by any um, financial um, funding. So um, I know you all know um, the effects of ETI on lung function. And we also know that um, in the phase three studies, the quality of life was measured with the um, score and it was already, always reported the respiratory domain, domain with the respiratory symptoms improving um, drastically. Um, but we also know that there are increasing reports of potential side effects of ETI on mental health. So we were actually, um, we designed a multi-center observational trial in Germany called Modulate CF, and um, where we're looking at different aspects of um, the treatment. And one part we designed was um, patient reported outcomes, where we looked at mental health and quality of life. And um, so I will focus, although you heard I'm a pediatrician, I will focus only on the adult cohort in this talk and only on the short-term effects of ETI on three months. If you're interested in other parts of our study, you're more than welcome to visit the posters. So we looked at quality of life, um, health related with the CFQR that you probably are all familiar with, just a short, um, there are 12 domains, and we already heard about the um, body image, but there are different um, things. And as I said, mostly reported are the respiratory symptoms, but I think the other items are very important um, to our patients as well. Next, we looked at um, depression symptoms. Um, we used the PHQ-9 that you're probably familiar with, but also the BDIFS. So I'll shortly um, introduce them. The PHQ-9 has nine items. And um, we used um, 0 to 4 for minimal scores and 15 to 27 for severe scores. And the BDIFS um, score is a um, symptom score of, for depression, which is uh, used in Germany widely because it factors out a little bit more the somatic issues um, so that it tries to focus a little bit more on the symptomatic and on the psychological issues of depression because we know in CF that we have many symptoms that could overlay with the other scores. And then we also looked at um, anxiety using, using the GAD-7 nice, uh, score. And here again, I think you're very familiar with that. And just um, to see um, what kind of scales we used for um, the symptoms. So our study population, as I said, 70 adult um, patients with a mean age of um, 28 years. We had a pretty um, good um, group, 51% uh, of female um, patients. And um, just to remind you again, we had a baseline visit before the initiation of ETI and a follow-up visit after three months of ETI in this study. And um, for the FEV1, we have a mean FEV1 of um, about 67% um, and a BMI of 21 in this group. So when we look at the clinical results, they are pretty comparable to what we observed in the clinical trials with a, a massive um, improvement in sweat chloride, a massive improvement in FEV1, and increase of body mass index. And when we look at the CFQR respiratory domain, that was also comparable to the clinical trials, we saw an improvement in the total cohort. Looking at the quality of life, um, that's a pretty big table, I know. Um, overall, we observed pretty good improvement in, all, in, in most items um, for the quality of life, but I want to highlight that emotional functioning um, was not improved. Um, eating problems were not improved, digestive symptoms, um, and also weight. So um, we heard about the limitations of the quality of life in, in some of those um, things, but I think that's important that also the eating, digestive, and weight did not improve um, in our study. When looking at symptoms of depression, 
um, we saw an overall improvement in the PHQ-9 scores. And I think you can appreciate that a lot of patients with mild symptoms at baseline uh, really go into the minimal um, symptom group. And also um, that the moderate and severe group, um, they more or less stay the same. And looking at the BDI, um, we basically see the same um, uh, result. And here you see a high group of minimal um, at the baseline. And you always have to remind, um, or I have to remind you that the patients came in and they knew they were getting ETI. So I think our baseline values do not really compare to the real life that we would have um, done probably a year before. Um, that's why we have a really high group of minimal symptoms um, at baseline. But even though um, this still improved. Looking at anxiety in the overall cohort, we did not see an improvement um, in um, any of the symptoms. What was really interesting when we digged more into um, our study, that we saw a gender-specific effects um, of ETI on mental health. And when we look at the CFQR, we see that they are pretty comparable um, between males and females. So it seems like the respiratory symptoms improve in both uh, patient groups. But when we look at um, the symptom scores of mental health, we see that female patients did not improve in depression nor in anxiety. But male patients, remember in the overall cohort, we did not see an improvement in anxiety. But uh, in the male patients, we saw an improvement in depression as well as anxiety. So in summary, um, I think um, quality of life is substantially improved, sorry. <laughs> um, oh, it's generally, uh, but um, the CFTR modulators um, improve the respiratory symptoms. ETI improves CFQR items, social functioning, body image, treatment burden, vitality, health percep perception, and role functioning. Um, ETI improves symptoms of depression, but not anxiety in the overall group. But we do see gender-specific effects on depression and anxiety. And I think that's really a big thing that we need to investigate more, why this is the case. Um, so I'm really happy to get your input um, why this could be um, the case. And with that, I want to really thank um, our team in Berlin um, for that study and for the support overall. And thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. And for our last speaker before we will have everyone come up here um, to do questions, our last speaker is Savine. Um, Sabine von der Laan, and she is a physician and a clinical ep epidemiologist, and she is now currently pursuing a PhD and working at Wilhelmina Children's Hospital through Utrecht University in the Netherlands. So welcome, Sabine. Thank you. So how do I proceed? Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, Dutchies are not used to air conditioning, so my voice is a bit uh, affected. <laughs> um, I'm doing a PhD at the moment on resilience, so I'm not a CF expert. Um, and I just handed in my thesis right before I got on the plane. And this... <laughs> <laughs> and this was one of my case studies. Um, so everyone who is noted on this slide put tremendous work in this study, and I want to acknowledge that. I have no disclosures to present. <clears throat> we all know from safety and efficacy studies, just as Simon just um, presented, that both biological determinants as well as health-related quality of life improves um, tremendously after use of ETI. But we also know from case studies that not all individuals experiencing these improvement in mental health, but have other mental health issues, such as the anxiety, brain fog, uh, and depression. And I was wondering who are those people? And are what 
uh, these people are experiencing? Are they able to report it as much as they are experiencing? Um, because I read in other studies that sometimes they don't dare to report it as they are afraid that their ETI will not continue. So if there is an underreporting of this, these symptoms, then there's also an underestimation of the mental health effect of ETI. So we came up with a few questions. First, do we see in our study sample changes in psychosocial health after ETI? And who is potentially at risk for these mental health issues? To be more concrete, these were our three objectives. First, do we see it, to investigate if and how psychosocial health changes? Then do we see differences in changes in psychosocial health among subgroups? And then could we find candidate predictors for psychosocial health at baseline, so before use of ETI, that predict psychosocial health after use of ETI six months after? How did we do that? This was our study design. In the Netherlands, unfortunately, um, ETI was quite late approved to be reimbursed by healthcare um, insurance. And we knew that negotiations were going on, but we didn't know when it would be approved. So we were expecting it, it, sh it would be um, January 2022. And therefore, we said everyone who was eligible for ETI, we invited them for medical consultations as well as for our mental health questionnaires. And then luckily it was improved in January 2022. And then three, six and nine months after use of ETI, we invited them again um, to complete the same questionnaires and also six months after use of ETI for medical consultation. And it should be said that this was regardless of clinical care, so it was next to clinical care. What was our primary outcome? It was psychosocial health measured with the pediatric quality of life. And it contains of four different subscales, the total pediatric quality of life. And we used a combined scale of emotional, social and school study work subscales. And it should be said that it, it's a bit strange to use a pediatric quality, or pediatric quality of life questionnaire when you're including adolescents and adults. However, it is a beautiful questionnaire that captures um, psychosocial health and it is adjusted um, to adolescents and adults and therefore we find it very useful. And next to that, we wanted to use another uh, disease specific uh, POM, but we wanted to use a more generic um, patient reported outcome measure. And also the um, pediatric quality of life skill comes with a minimal clinical relevant difference and it's 4.4 points. So when it's over these, um, so when experience a, a change of more than 4.4 points, it's clinically relevant. Our subgroups were based on sex, age, lung function, early use of safety iron modulators, and we added another subgroup based on literature as people who are, were using psychotropic medications might be more at risk. People were included if they were 12 years or older, um, starting ETI based or were eligible for it based on their safety arm mutation um, from January uh, 2022 onwards. And this implicit, implicitly means that people who were already on compassionate care programs um, were not included in this study and they had to be a patient in our hospital. We used covariance pattern models um, to analyze AIM-1 and 2, and we use, use linear regression models to analyze AIM-3. Um, and as not all people um, completed all questionnaires at all visits, we used multiple imputation to impute the missings. So in total, 177 people signed informed consent, of which 98% of them completed questionnaires three months before use of ETI. Then three, six and nine months after use of ETI, we had a completion rate ranging from 82 to 80%. So who was in our study? We had quite a young group with a mean age of 26 years old um, and the adolescents were in the majority. Females were the minority. And um, 
the, we had quite a moderate lung function and there were a few people only with a lung function under 40%. And I think it's due to the fact is that people with already a really bad lung function used ETI based on um, the compassionate use programs. Most of the people already used a CFTR modulator and 9% used uh, psychotropic medications. Our first aim was, do we see a change in psychosocial health? And the answer is yes, we did. It was a major significant, but also clinically relevant improvement in psychosocial health. Um, on a score from 1 to 100, before use of ETI, people had a score of 72. And nine months after, they scored almost 80 points. Keeping in mind that the clinically relevant difference is 4.4 points, this is major. Knowing where the substantial changes, we did some post, post hoc tests and we saw that the, well, the major chain, what change was between three months before and three months after use of ETI. Um, and then it remained stable, but did not increase. Focusing on the subgroups, we wanted to know whether we could see whether some subgroups had different changes in psychosocial health. Um, <clears throat> the figures are a bit small, so I will talk you through. Some um, subgroups seem to have higher scores compared to their counterparts. People with aged under uh, 25, males, people with a higher lung function, people who were already using CFTR modulators and people that did not use psychotropic medication seem to have higher uh, psychosocial health. However, when testing for it, um, we did not find any differences. But um, afterwards, we did post hoc test and wa we wanted to see whether there was a main or a structural difference, meaning that, for instance, people who were using psycho psychotropic medications always had a lower uh, psychosocial health compared to people who were not using it. And we identified that indeed those people had a structural lower uh, psychosocial health. And you can see it in the picture uh, right uh, under. Um, then we wanted to know, do subgroups potentially have a differential change, meaning that they have an increased um, improvement of their psychosocial health compared to their counterparts. But we did not um, see this differential change. So in conclusion, people using psychotropic medications do seem to have lower structural, lower um, psychosocial health. However, they also improved uh, after using ETI. It would be really convenient if one of the subgroups just popped up um, because then you already know where to focus on who might be at risk. However, we did not find that. And therefore, we wanted to see if we couldn't find candidate predictors for psychosocial health um, after six months use of ETI. And well, it's quite logical that we couldn't find it based on one factor because you are always more, for instance, than your sex or your age or your lung function. So we put in biological factors, but also pharmaceutical factors, picked it in gray, and um, psychological factors. Um, and I want to introduce two um, concepts that I haven't talked about uh, till now. Um, these concepts, illness identity and illness perception, were also measured with questionnaires um, in the package in this study. Illness identity means the way how one ident well, identifies or integrates the illness in one's identity. And there are four different concepts described. The upper two you see in the figure are associated with a lower mental health and the uh, the two, um, the lower two are associated with a better, um, well, mental health. So engulfment means that you have a disease and you, it totally dominates your whole being. Rejection means, well, you have a disease, but well, you don't have a disease. So you reject it as part of you. Acceptance is that you're fine with having the disease, but it does not uh, determine your whole life. Um, and enrichment means that you actually um, find positive life change and changes due to the disease you have. 
And in the little table, you see the mean scores of people of these different concepts at baseline. We also measured illness perception. Uh, it's on a scale from one to 10. With 10, you uh, experience the disease or the illness um, as threatening, whereas zero, you don't experience the illness as threatening. So we put all the different um, factors, the biological factors, the pharmaceutical factors, and the psychological factors in one model. And we find some um, remarkable results because none of the biological factors were significant, none of the pharmaceutical factors were, but psychosocial health um, at baseline was associated with an approved psychosocial health six months after use of EDI. And people who, are, who were having an acceptance illness identity, they also had an improved um, psychosocial health six months after use of ETI. And this is good news, I think, because you can't change your age, nor your sex or lung function, but you can change the way how um, you integrate the disease into your new identity. And therefore, for instance, illness identity could be a target um, for ter therapeutic interventions. So to conclude, on group level, we found a clinically relevant improvement in psychosocial health with the most substantial change three months before and three months after use of ETI. We found no clear differences in subgroups with regard to psychosocial health, but we find key predictors for improved psychosocial health, meaning illness identity and baseline psychosocial health. Thank you so much for listening, and if you have any questions. And now if we can have all of our speakers just come up here and sit, and then we can ask our questions. And if anybody has any that they would like to ask in person, definitely please come up to the microphone. And if not, we'll go through the ones in the app. All right, so for our first question, this one is for, um, for Simon, and a lot of people upvoted this one, so I think a lot of people are curious um, if you have any hypotheses on why the male mental health might have improved and the fem female mental health did not, and then part two of that was, did you see this trend in the children and adolescent group as well? Yeah, so... Um Obviously a pretty good question, thank you very much, um, and it's a really tough one. Um, we have been thinking about that a lot, and we don't have a clear answer, I can tell you that. So one thing is obviously that we know that, um, that women have more exacerbations and have a lower survival, so you would think that that might be a factor, but I think what we have seen in your talk, and also um, in the quality of life, that they, the health-related quality of life was actually comparable. So um, I don't know if that's a sufficient explanation, and that's why we are still looking uh, into that, why that is, and we don't have a clear answer, unfortunately. Um, and for the younger groups, we have not analyzed that yet, so um, I cannot say that, but we are really looking into that. Thank you. So um, I don't necessarily have a, a question. I am from the University of Wisconsin. I'm a regulatory coordinator. But my perspective is coming from um, being a parent of a child with CF. So my son is uh, 27. And it's interesting how things have changed because since he's been on Tricapta, his health has changed. But his mental health has changed, and it has decreased. And I think um, some of that perspective is all through life. Um, he's always especially as he started to get more sick, he's had this perception that he's going to die by the time he's 30. You know, he's getting sicker and sicker. So his outlook on life, in order to protect himself, I believe he probably um, just kind of accepted that. And so now, you know, he also didn't always make wise decisions as far as, you know, saving or anything. You know, he lived in the moment. And now that he has this drug that makes him feel better and gives him hope, 
now you he is to a point where um, like he said instead of looking to find a job for insurance I have to now consider yeah. looking to find a job with a pension you know and different things like that but um, I think the biggest thing is uh, it is those those things going forward is he didn't feel like he planned enough for a longer life so now what does he do how does he play catch up and as a parent you also think did I do something wrong in raising him you know and being he's my first child I didn't know anything different I don't know what it was like to raise a healthy child or that thing and and not to live in those fears every day before we've got to this point you know of always wondering when that ball is gonna drop and that type of thing and I think it's just it's interesting because like I said you're seeing improvement and he is has improved on that aspect but he's he's I guess more acknowledging things that he needs to do in order to function so it's more of a almost like an ADHD and a brain fog because now it's like oh I have to figure out what I need to do to be able to have a long life and how do I do that now so I just appreciate all the um, research that's being done and just wanted to give you another perspective Thank you. Thank you very, oh, go ahead. Sorry, for the research on the body image, as you are having those discussions, are you also talking about like, so for so long it's like high calorie, high protein, eat as many snacks as you can. So, so changing that mindset of diet and like healthy food choices and then also exercise choices, or is it just like embracing, like, like what does that part of the discussion look like? Well, so my discussions are from my kind of my discipline standpoint. So I, I do talk a lot about body acceptance and our other team members, you know, one of the things our center has really tried to um, incorporate is doing more focus on body composition. So not BMI, not focusing on weight, but looking at overall body comp and helping patients to become more educated about like what our DEXA scans actually mean and fo fostering kind of a, uh, embracing physical activity as as a both a mental health act act but also for physical health and and weight management and that's something that like is isn't just me like that's something that our dietitian has been working really hard on um she had gotten some um she had some discussions with our our i think the radiology team and figuring out how to get the right um output on the DEXA scan so we could actually have those conversations and she's done that found some other great measures for peds too um and also our respiratory therapists and the providers so i would say in general we are as a as a group moving towards um incorporating the the what you're discussing there like the balanced the a more healthy diet versus a quote-unquote cf diet and we've been doing that for a, a long time i think even prior to modulators but it's not just me so my role is um i i see it as a bit more focused on helping the person feel find parts of themselves that feel like um they're at home in their body and and also setting goals and working towards them but goals that they want to do All right, Kimberly, I have a question for you. Um, so, and this one sort of popped up. So many times medication may not be the best option for people experiencing anxiety or depression. People with CF already take many medications, already even with the advent of ETI. Were there other options offered besides just start another pill? Absolutely. Um, one of the discussions with both the adult and the peds mental health coordinators with our families in clinic are what would you like how would you like to manage your symptoms and 
we have a back and forth conversation about what they would like to try. Um, sometimes there's a lot of those stigma issues coming in of, well, what does that mean? So we definitely tackle those and we definitely do referrals back to whatever resources that they are open to accepting. From a research perspective, it is very hard to track how people are doing looking at counseling when you're doing chart review. So in terms of tracking how someone is doing, it's a little bit easier to look into the pharmacy, um, what medications they're taking and doses and things like that and term, pull out information than did they stop going to counseling, especially if we're not providing the count, doing all of the counseling because a lot of people we send out back into their community if they're from four hours away, sometimes we try to find something that's a little bit closer to their own home. So it's a much harder to track, are they in counseling? Did they stop counseling? Did they restart counseling? When did they start counseling? When did they stop counseling? So from a research perspective, it's a much easier to track medications. Yeah, and I think just to stay with you. Um, so there was another question, how do people with CF, the numbers differ from the general population? I think that has to do with prescriptions. Do you have any, like, what do you mean? So in your sample of people with CF compared to the general population? Well, I think as Dr. Quintner shared with the TIDE study, we have some idea of that our population of depression and anxiety is a little bit higher than the general population. Um, and we also know as we just had the <laughs> other question about, uh, or sorry, the other um, comment that even though we're on track half to, we're also experiencing those existential questions, which are triggering more mental health um, questions and dilemmas, and I didn't plan for this. So um, I think we're pretty solid in saying that our research has said that compared to the general population, um, this is a problem and we need to make sure we're addressing it. All right, our next top one um, is not a question, but just, um, a comment of we need to also keep in mind that people with CF are living longer and so therefore also at increased risks for heart issues, blood pressure issues, diabetes, osteoporosis, and other issues that are related to obesity. Um, definitely, and I think that will probably be an increasing area um, of research. Go ahead. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Um, so I wanted to just comment on the gender differences that you found in your study. Um, a study will be coming out very soon by Dr. Sonia Graziano in, in Rome, and they followed patients very similarly before Trakafta baseline, one month, three months, six months. She's now collecting 12 and 18 month data. We also found worse um, outcomes for women, and particularly we had a side effects checklist. And women had more side effects than men on ETI, and interestingly, they persisted over the longitudinal uh, course. So we were also trying to speculate what these could be about. And one, maybe hormonal, hormonal re, you know, re changes in women, which may uh, predispose them to have worse outcomes. And we certainly see worse outcomes in terms of lifespan for women, comorbidities for women with CF versus men. Another thing I wanted to point out is that you showed the beautiful clinical trial data on the CFQR, and you're absolutely right. No one really pays attention to the fact that we didn't see any improvements in digestion, in weight, um, and in uh, eating problems. We actually didn't see any improvements. And so we wonder, too, if that's a reflection a little bit of some of the side effects people may have in the GI area. And so these are a few things I think we need to think about. And my final comment is to Lily that you are absolutely on target with needing to add and update some items to the CFQR, which of course I do love the CFQR, <laughs> but I think it's time, I mean, this is a new era. And so I think it'll be really time to think about in this new era of modulators, adding some items. So I may be reaching out to people uh, as a project to do that. Thank you. Um, this question, um, I believe, is for Kimberly. Um, for the, um, you mentioned a 34% group. Um, what percentage of that group appeared to be suicidal? And then a follow up question, which um, could be probably for anybody's experience um, has the suicidal rate increased? 
So last year we presented our adult data in terms of um, part of our study is looking at the depression scores and the anxiety scores. So we do know that there is a very there was a very small percentage of our population that um, experienced suicidal ideation that increased in that first um, time period. Um, again, it's very hard to pin down causation. Uh, I think it's only fair to call it correlational, um, but that is definitely something that we are looking into because we do have the mental health scores that have that information too, and we did that as part of our poster last year. Okay. All right. Um, are there any current theories about mechanistic reasons why ETI might affect mental health? Is there any one of you? <laughs> so I, I think we had a, a pretty lively discussion about this yesterday in the ADHD um, and executive functioning uh, uh, symposium. And I think, you know, there are a lot of different theories um, out there about how modulators may affect the brain in general, um, which you know, our mental health is housed in the brain. And so there's, I mean, there's so many different components to this ranging from glucose management to CFTR in the brain to some of the neuroimmune hypotheses. All of these are inflammation. <laughs> yes, all of these, you know, um, hypoxia, you know, gas exchange problems. There's so many different dimensions to this and we don't know why, but I, we're, I know I think that's a really important area of research that will be, I'm hoping will be coming out. I am not a basic researcher, um, but I think some of the animal models, you know, uh, show promise in terms of even looking at the CFTR in the brain um, and kind of looking at how that pans out. I, does anyone else have any input on that? Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah I, I agree. I agree totally with what you said. And I, I know there's one study in the mouse model where they um, measured um, Ivacaftor and products of Ivacaftor, and they see that it binds to serotonin receptors um, in the mice. Um, but yeah, we don't know what that means. In, in that model, it improved um, a model of depression, um, but it's a mouse model. I don't know how widely it's used but um yeah so i think we are pretty at an early point there but i think there needs to be a lot of research to further understand what is really happening in the brain go ahead i just wanted to share i'm also a parent and thank you so much for dedicating so much space to this mental health issue i was delighted when i saw for the conference all of the sessions about it because i have a 19 year old daughter now, she did have some underlying anxiety and depression, but she started Trikafta, seemed okay. We sent her six hours away to college, seemed to be doing fine, had a major mental breakdown, major. I mean, had to come home and, and looking back was probably a blessing because the psychiatric institutions did not want to take her because of the CF, but she did outpatient for many months. She's now, we went off of the Trikafta, and I give our center, Johns Hopkins, a lot of credit because right away, they're like, oh, go off of Trikafta. She now has gone increasingly back on. They started flipping the AM and PM dosage, and she's now back on it, full throttle. Her lung improvement has not been a big jump, but the most important is that psychologically, she now seems to be in a good place. But I can say when this happened to me, you think you're all alone. The, oh my gosh, how did this happen? You know, where have I screwed up as a parent? But I really think that there are so many underlying issues and I love the ADHD session as well. So thank you everyone. Thanks for all the work you're doing. I just wanna, I just wanna add that we try to have a very open mind at our center in terms of having mental health symptoms after starting Trikafta. And we've instituted a sort of a structure to, if you think there's something going on, please call us. And then the next step is we wanna see you. And so we bring them back and they have a full visit with everybody. If they're old enough to do PFTs and wait and everything, we gather that. And then we have a conversation, team and family, about what are we seeing, 
is is what the the pros and cons is it worth it do we want to change something how bad is it um and then we present them do you want to half your dose do you want to flip your doses do you want to go cold turkey and go off of it and we say okay great let's make a plan we make a plan as a team of what they want to do we do the plan and then they return in a month and reevaluate with the a, explanation to the family of remember if you remove trichafta we have to put those other things back in place and that weighs in in the conversation especially for those kids 10 11 12 13 14 oh crap i have to go back on all those things when we had already gotten so excited about going off of them they weigh into that do we what is worth it obviously i also set them up with mental health resources at the same time but it's constantly balancing mental health CF needs and it's an it's not a one size fits all. So thank you. I just want to comment too, we have a very similar process at our centers. And I think one of the things that I hope will come out is more data on adjusted doses for side effects, both mental health and otherwise. Um, it, it seems like the Wild West kind of when we're <laughs> having these discussions because we don't know, <clears throat> excuse me, exactly how it'll affect any individual. But I think that that monitoring and collaboration is the key. Okay. So Simon, this question's for you. Um, were you able to control for items such as use of alcohol and marijuana, social and family <laughs> stressors and other things that could play into anxiety and depression symptoms increasing or decreasing? Um, so that's a pretty good question, and unfortunately, um, no, we couldn't um, control for that. I mean, that was not assessed and is not regularly assessed at our center, but it's actually a good point in moving forward to look at those things, yeah. This question could be, um, they didn't specify a presenter, so for anybody, um, do you utilize ETI dose adjustments for patients with mental health decline reported? And I think some of you answered it, but if anybody else would like to add to that. Yeah, so I mean, we have a pretty similar approach as we just heard. Um, I'm always, um, and that's what, what um, the comment was also about, um, we, we usually, are pretty quick on going off um, of ETI to resolve everything, but I think it's very important to try to go back on um, because we know that, um, I mean, there's also a placebo effect of taking something off, um, especially in mental health. So I think that's important that we really, I mean, we know all the benefit, the clinical benefits um, of ETI. So I think it's always worth uh, retrying. And we heard a lot of different aspects where, how we can try to do that, but that's something that's important to me. All right, this question is for Sabine. Um, based on your study results, should illness identity be incorporated in standard clinical care? And if so, are there any known strategies or programs to help, um, help us move towards this acceptance and that identity acceptance you mentioned? Um, I think based on these results, uh, it, would be way convenient, it would be convenient to put it in clinical care or at least pay attention to it. Um, it is quite a new concept. I think that um, in 2008, the first questionnaire was um, developed and therefore then I, I searched online, but I couldn't find any program yet to change illness identity, but I can imagine that with co cognitive behavior therapy, um, this would work. Yeah. I think this is for everyone. Okay. The studies have focused on the three to 12 month period of following ETI initiation. Are there any plans to expand these studies beyond this time frame? I have noticed in clinic that patients who have experienced an improvement in mental health in the first year of ETI use are now starting to experience a decline in mental health. Many of the issues presenting include not planning for the future, frustration of not having access to the medication earlier, decreased physical symptoms and burden of care, freeing up space for patients to focus more on their mental health concerns, feelings of waiting for the other shoe to drop, and what will my health decline look like now? Not sure if others are noticing the same or if plans to study this. 
So I guess the question to recap, because that was long, um, oh, and I lost it. Are there plans to expand? Are there plans to expand? Follow up. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think that's a that's a very important point, and um, we obviously want to know the long-term effects. And I have to say that uh, I'm from Europe as well, and we are a little bit behind. So it was um, in Germany was approved in in August um, 2020, um, but we are obviously looking at the long-term effects. And I think some of the studies are going for five years, and I think so. We are still um, it's very high priority to look at long-term effects. Yes, our study is going for five years, and with the rolling enrollment, it will never end. <laughs> it feels that way. <laughs> yes, definitely a very important um, topic, and particularly what they mentioned of like initial increase, but then decline, I think will be very interesting for future research. Um, this one is for um, Robin. Any negative comments um, in the interviews about the effect on mental health? We have had adult patients indicate they had not planned to live so long. They'd always been told they would die young and they were not prepared mentally or financially to live longer. I'll just stand up here versus sitting down. Um, so yes, but in terms of doing the Quest study and analyses for this um, project that I presented, they didn't come out in terms of one of our main themes. Um, I think as we move towards publication, obviously that's something that we will look at a little bit more. Um, so we did have some, some negative comments as well. Hi. Uh, thanks very much. Martha McKinney from CHLA. Um, I guess I have a quick comment before I ask my question, and one is we also had a couple of cases of, of patients who had very dramatic mental health changes on ETI and did some very creative dose changing and and taking off and starting and, and things like that. And I think we really do need to get together as a group to kind of uh, get that out because I think everybody has a few cases and it would be great to put them together. Um, and my, my question is for those who, who looked at um, responses and, and clinical factors in that, um, when you look at the waterfall plots for response to ETI, um, whether it's FEV1 or whether it's, um, you know, questionnaire responses or things like that, some people have a very mild response, some people have a very strong response. Um, is there any correlation with the degree of re response either to CFQR or to FEV1 and the mental health? Uh, changes. Um, if you have mild changes in your life and your symptoms and, and things, is it better or worse for your mental health if you have more extreme changes in any of those parameters? Do you have more extreme changes in mental health, life stress, things like that? Um, has anybody looked at that? So we focus on the correlation of change in psychosocial health and between the change in uh, lung function, and it was a moderate correlation. So I think uh, R of 0 0.5, well, uh, from a heart, but so um, I think uh, not only the increase in lung function is associated with a better psychosocial health. So it's more than that, and it's logical because CF is a multi organ uh, condition. Yeah, so our numbers with 70 patients was actually too low to really, I mean, we looked at correlations, but there were no clear signals. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Good morning, and thank you for your research. Uh, really, really valuable. A lot of you looked into body image and talked about anxiety and depression, but I'm curious to note, was eating disorders at all, is there any correlation or any discovery of any connection to eating disorders as you did this focus work on body image and, and weight, et cetera? So um, ours is a quality improvement project. So um, I, it is not a study. We were not studying this. Um, it is really about patient care improvement. Um, and there are, we have a, a handful of folks who do have eating disorders prior to having started um, ETI. Um, and some of them have had challenges with the weight gain component in terms of having additional triggering symptoms. Um, 
I can't off the top of my head think of anybody who has developed an eating disorder that I am aware of. But I think, you know, that's something that I hope that our relationship with these patients is something that they can bring up if it is occurring. I, what I hear more so from patients is a lot of distress about the weight gain rather than trying to use any compensatory responses or anything like that or developing new binge eating behaviors. That's not really something I've seen. Um, I will say I can think of at least five patients, though, who have come to our team and asked, can we go on Ozempic? <laughs> um, can we be referred to, you know, a weight management physician, things like that. But um, really kind of, you know, some of the more um, up and coming weight loss interventions, but no, no disordered eating that I've seen. But again, this is a quality improvement project and we weren't specifically studying that. So we have not looked at that specifically, but what I can, I mean, I think it, you already mentioned it in your talk that we always have to keep in mind that all that happened during the pandemic. Yeah. And in Germany, we saw um, in the pediatric cohort a massive increase in eating disorders um, during that period. Um, <laughs> so that's why it will be very, very tough to kind of um, take that out um, with the therapy, at least in Germany, because I said August 2020. Um, so we are right in that time period. And I don't think that's possible to take that out. Thank you. The one thing that I will say is sometimes when we've poked into teenagers' adherence issues of why they're not taking the Trikafta, and it doesn't usually come out in the first round. Sometimes it comes out in the second conversation or the third conversation. Um, sometimes they're skipping doses of Trikafta because they don't like their weight gain. And so it starts off as a conversation about adherence, and it ends up being a conversation about something a lot bigger and it opens that door to oh and we were very aware that those were conversation those issues especially with the individual that i'm thinking of they did not they were not triggered by the track after they just created a new set of challenges that we now have to address in a different way thank you I just wanted to mention that we are, as we downwardly extend Trikafta to our younger ages, school age and now preschool, some of these same mental health behavioral concerns are coming up. And I just wanted to put it out there that Dr. Daniel Getz, who is the center director at Buffalo, has built a REDCap database. So if any of you have been using the pediatric symptom checklist, which many of us have and we've sort of recommended it on our listserv, get in touch with Dr. Daniel Getz or, or myself and um, then we're wanting to really pool these data. So if you've collected pediatric symptom checklist data in your children with CF, we're trying to gather this all together so that we could write up a paper, given that we're sort of waiting and hoping that there may be someday a TIDES 2.0, which we're uh, putting in a proposal to, to develop you know, the best screening measures for children under 12. But in the meantime, this might give us some very helpful data. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Stephanie Foligno. I'm at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. I'm a psychologist embedded in the team. And I just wanted to um, put a plug in there for all of us as we have people who are starting ETI for the first time. Now, we've had some folks who've been on it for a while, but we do such a great job of getting people prepared through eye exams and liver labs and those sorts of things. We also want to make sure that people have connections to mental health at that time like we do with those other preparatory sorts of steps. Um, and then I also wanted to note that we've had um, a, a lot of really important um, statements being made by parents of young adults about how important it is to have that mental health connection at different transition points in life. So thank you to whoever that was around here who made that point about your 19 year old daughter. Um, it's, um, it's really important for people to ask um, and for us to continue to explore the options for telemedicine to extend and reach people who are in different places. Um, um, in the state of Ohio, Ohio is a SIPAC state, which for those of you who aren't familiar, we're now able, based on state legislature being passed, 
to, as psychologists, practice telemedicine across state lines. So I have probably five to seven of our young adults that I've been able to continue to see as they transition to their college dorms. And it's been so meaningful for me as someone who cares about them to be able to help them through what is at baseline a very um, potentially rocky transition regardless of chronic disease and then when you have that added layer of chronic disease burden and stress and how does this affect your social relationship development um, I just really want to encourage us to work really hard to use telemedicine when possible to provide the support thank you Um, so a couple more questions, I think. So Kimberly, these are for you. You ready? Um, and I'm going to combine two of them. So are you able to provide psychological interventions in your center? And did you look at medications for ADHD? So we did look at ADHD and we, um, addressed that in our session yesterday. That was the ADHD and executive functioning, um, in terms of how that changed in the first year uh, with kids with ETI. Um, so I refer you back to, to that and I'll be happy to answer that question as we um, move forward. First part was- uh, Do you deliver counseling? Yeah. So I am offering services through brief interventions in the community, or brief interventions in clinic and then I generally hook up our families with uh, community providers. Um, there's some, when we talk about how we make our jobs sustainable and we talk about billing and politics and all that good stuff, um, that's one where my position has some really kind of yucky politics attached to it. Um, so I don't bill and if I start doing therapy outside of clinic, um, it, it creates some problems and so all of my services are provided in a medical <laughs> clinic setting. But one of the things that we, you know, when you talk to a lot of people and you work with uh, the peer consultation groups and things like that, we talk about different styles and roles of how we do our jobs. Um, I spend a lot of the time on the phone. I spend a lot of time on the phone. So if I have someone that I am really worried about, we'll talk about it, we'll sort of make a plan of what they're willing to do and we'll do a brief intervention and then I may be following them for three months and calling them every week to follow up with them and work through the problem solving. Um, I'm the pediatric mental health coordinator so sometimes it's not the individual, sometimes it's a young adult, sometimes it's working with a family, um, our parents, a mom, a dad, a grandparent who is the caregiver. Um, so I don't do the classic sit in a room for 50 minutes and see people for therapy. Um, I just do everything else. <laughs> All right. And we'll do, um, of course, definitely more in-person questions if you have any. Um, Kimberly, there's a couple more for you um, to put you on the spot here. Um, I, you might have already mentioned, you might have already answered this question in one of your previous responses, but um, when you evaluated the prescription medications for mental health, um, were you able to evaluate um, like counseling therapy support groups? I think you had mentioned because it was chart review, you really weren't able to. Yeah, it's really messy from a research perspective. And given that we're looking at adults and children, um, it's much easier if uh, to track their use of mental health services if it was a kid who used our services or showed up in the care everywhere epic system but otherwise a lot of our adults that we're also tracking um, are not followed by nationwide children's services so it's really hard to keep track of when they start and stop counseling and we only get it via self-report when they come to clinic or if we have a reason to call them all right, and we'll do this as our last question. And then if you had a question that didn't get answered, um, if the speakers, if, they, if they're able to, they can stick around or definitely you can contact people through the app if you have questions after this. Um, so this one was also marked um, for Kimberly, but 
actually, I think this could probably be for anybody too, because this has come up. Um, have you considered correlating an increase in psychotropic medications with increased weight status with ETI? And I know this came up about future research ideas. I know that that is one of those things um, that is part of our research design is that we are pulling all of the clinical data and comparing it to the mental health data. Um, so that is an ongoing piece that we'll be reporting on in the future in terms of the mental health scores on measures and comparing it to clinical data, including BMI and um, PFTs and uh, various exacerbations and, and various clinical indicators. All right, we will stop here, but if you have additional questions, please feel free to reach out, and we thank you all for joining us.